Uh, here's the uh, argument in pertinent part that uh, Matt Gates made yesterday on the House floor to vacate the Speaker's chair to remove Kevin McCarthy. My colleague says we passed the strongest border bills in history. Well, guess what? Look at the border right now. We didn't use sufficient leverage in the debt limit or in any other thing to actually get results on the border. The border is a disaster, really something I don't think you're going to be campaigning on that you fixed the border. Second, you said you streamlined regulations. What the gentleman from Louisiana doesn't tell you is that all of the regulatory reform he was just bragging about is waivable by the stroke of a pen of someone in the Biden White House. Do you really think you got anything for that? It's a total joke. And then finally, the welfare to work that the gentleman from Louisiana said we got. The welfare programs that they said that they streamlined with their welfare to work stuff, they're actually going to grow. Because while they did work requirements, they blew out those programs with expanded eligibility. I'm real glad you guys didn't put work requirements on Medicaid. It probably would have resulted in Medicaid expansion. And when it comes to how those raise money, I take no lecture on asking patriotic Americans to weigh in and contribute to this fight from those who would grovel and bend knee for the lobbyists and special interests who own our leadership, who have, oh, boo all you want, who have hollowed out this town and have borrowed against the future of our future generations. I'll be happy to fund my political operation through the work of hardworking Americans, 10 and 20 and $30 at a time. And you all keep showing up at the lobbyist fundraisers and see how that goes for you. I reserve. And I'm running for the governor of Florida. Uh, it's a little disingenuous, especially Please. that last piece, a little disingenuous to say the least. By the way, he's not kidding about um, funding his uh, political operation with 30 and $40 donors because he was sending out email messages mm -hmm. to fundraise off of what was going on yesterday uh, in real time. Yeah, and, you know, the whole thing, like, a big money in politics, it's more complicated than just making a, sort of a general uh, categorical swipe in that direction. It's just a lot more complicated. Um, you need big money in politics at this point because those who would have everything run through the government, those who are interested in expanding Leviathan to make a society that is completely dominated by rent-seeking con conduct, They've got a lot of money. And so this is uh, this whole getting the money out of politics is really tilting at windmills until and unless you elect a better class of people that decide they want to really rethink the limits of government, what government should be doing and what it shouldn't be doing, and greatly diminish the what it should be doing to increase the stature of the ordinary citizen. But that's a long process, and it's not going to happen under one speaker, and it's not going to happen in 10 months either, which is this sort of completely distended expectations surrounding Kevin McCarthy. We, we didn't run up $33 trillion in debt, another $110, $20 trillion in unfunded liabilities uh, in the last 12 months, even the last three years, although we've certainly greatly added to it. The idea this all gets unwound and you and you have a narrow majority controlling one half of one third of the government. And not only are you going to pass things that uh, provide direction, but you're going to have accountability mechanisms that cannot be bypassed and must be implemented and will be implemented by people of bad faith, not just in elective office, but in the administrative agencies. And somehow the lack of doing that is the fault of one person. Come on. Come got on. A, got a text message. Dan and Amy, this isn't about the budget. It's not a one-issue move. Gates wanted McCarthy gone because McCarthy is a line slime ball uniparty politician. Yeah, well, that, I, that, that is not an argument. That's just ad hominem. And it's, it, it is completely lacking uh, responsiveness on the merits here. By the way, um, again, we, you heard from Jim Jordan. How about from Thomas Massey, you know, the libertarian from Kentucky? Um, you know, the, the, uh, everybody, so 96% of the caucus, including all of these individuals who have much better voting records than, say, Nancy Mace, one of the eight, they're all rhinos now. They're all beholden to nebulous special corporate interests. Here is the only still serving co author and co sponsor of the motion to vacate Speaker Boehner. I can tell you this motion to vacate is a terrible idea is the 
only member who's serving here who took every chance to vote against Speaker Boehner and to vote against Speaker Ryan. I can tell you that this chamber has, run, has been run better, more conservatively, and more transparently under Mr. McCarthy than any other speaker that I have served under. As a member of the Rules Committee, one, one of three, one of three conservatives who were placed there out of trust, the speaker gave us a blocking position by putting three of us on there to keep an eye on the Rules Committee, to make sure the process was fair and even. I can tell you it's been fair and even. None of us are voting against the speaker today. Right. So Thomas Massey, uh, who got to him? He was uh, happy to be an antagonist to Boehner and Ryan when they, they thought they were capitulating to their side, which they often were. And he says that about McCarthy. So what's the response to that? McCarthy's a lying slime ball. That's not responsive. Selena Zito joins us now with more on the topic. National political reporter, of course, author of The Great Revolt Inside the Populist Coalition Reshaping American Politics. You can check out her musings and reporting at selenazito.com. Selena, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So what's your reflection on all that has transpired in the last 24 hours? Well, I'll try to keep it nice. <laughs> all right. Don't, no, don't. Let's don't, get dirty. We, we, have a, we have an FCC we've got to comply with. You know, so. Right, right, right. Okay, I'll, I'll try to I'll, – I'll keep it um, above the FCC. I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll be um, diligent with my words. Uh, Gates is a fool. It was the most ridiculous thing I have seen, and I have been covering American politics for 30-plus years. It is all ego-driven. There is no sort of moral standing that he went on. I, I regret that you made me listen to that speech again because <laughs> I could pick every part apart, uh, everything apart about it. There was nothing that he said that was true. He took tiny little grains of information and tried to make it the truth. And it, it, it is no different than what the Democrats do. And it's hysterical to me to watch him and seven other Republicans and all the Democrats take out McCarthy. The, these magnificent, unmagnificent eight should be, should be burned in our memory for, for what they did. It was unprecedented. It was foolish. It was driven by ego, and there is no moral compass to anything that they said other than getting attention. And and, and it, I apologize, but it is reminiscent of what Donald Trump does when he wants to get his way. And this is sort of the government that we have put in place. But you don't think Trump was behind this at all, do you? I mean, oh, he yeah, tweeted yeah. that he was sure. that he Pardon? Yeah, well, I, I'm sure he was. Really, I would be surprised. Yeah, I would be surprised if if he wasn't. He's been wanting to get back at McCarthy, despite the fact that McCarthy has done sort of acrobatic moves uh, to try to placate his anger. Um, but yeah, well, I, I'm sure there was some whispering in Gates' ears, uh, and and Gates he wants to run for governor of Florida. Well, so, um. But but I mean Nancy Mace and Ken Buck they're not exactly Trump loyalists. No, they're not. But it wasn't. I'm not saying he whispered in their ears. I'm saying he whispered in Gates' ears. They had their own reasons for doing what they did. And and you know I think in the coming weeks we'll be able to sort of unpack what their reasons were. But none of those reasons are reflective of their districts. Well, and and part of this too, it, you know, ultimately comes down to okay. I mean, they clearly had no plan. They had no, uh, you know, organized succession. If this were to be successful, they got no buy-in other than from uh, themselves, the eight. But but the uh, upshot is, if you get a Steve Scalise, if you get a Jim Jordan, then they're going to declare vindication. And to some extent, look, I don't, I'm not, I'm not in love with Kevin McCarthy any more than I am with any other politician. They're temporary representatives that I want to see do specific things. And then if they don't do them, then move on, get somebody else who might. Um, so if, if the end result is a Jordan or a Scalise, uh, don't, 
aren't the aren't the unmagnificent eight vindicated? No, because they're not going to get anything different than they got under McCarthy. He is, has a slim majority in one third of the governing body of our country, where the rest, where the other party holds power. He had very little wiggle room to do much of anything. And quite honestly, if you look at this, even from an, uh, you know, standing back and looking what he was able to accomplish, it's pretty, pretty impressive. You know that that job is thankless. You're not just the speaker of your party. You're the speaker of the entire house. And he was able to navigate it, keep things as conservative as possible, given the numbers that he had, mm-hmm. and and still be um, um, able to pass things that were important. And 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 I, I'm just I'm just stunned at 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 what these eight voted for. And I, I don't think they understand what they have uncorked with this decision well, because there's going to be nothing done after this. Well, now, given a, well, they've given a black eye to the Republican Party, too. I mean, seriously, this, this yeah. is a time when a majority of Americans are placing trust in Republicans to handle the economy, national security, the border crisis that we're having, and then they go and do this. And I don't think, you know, where can they go to get their reputation back? They can't. This is damning what they did yesterday. Everyone is going to look at Republicans as a joke, and yeah. it's going to be hard to find them voting for a joke. Look, they is have it, a decision to make. Voters have a decision. I'm going to vote for a joke, or I'm going to vote for people who keep the border open. Neither of them instill much trust. Uh, what about um, the prospect that it could get worse? Um, how real is that, that uh – I don't know. The eight could uh, collaborate with Democrats again to do uh, to to elevate somebody who is, um, you know, significantly to the left of McCarthy. Is that a possibility or is the caucus going to move past the the acrimony that this has generated and make sure they do get someone like a Scalise or a Jordan that is palatable to the majority? I don't think they have the ability to move past anything. They are firmly wedded in their own elevation. And when you get to that point in your head, when you live in Washington and you're surrounded by a staff that tells you how wonderful you are and no one is telling you, oh, my Lord in heaven, please don't do this, you are never able to sort of uh, look at the world with clear eyes. But I mean, so but but I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about the aid. I'm talking about the rest of the caucus making sure that uh that you don't have, I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the scenarios that are being uh, bandied about, like you actually could have a, these eight, uh, I, I don't really see how this is possible, but I'll just say it, that these eight could decide with the Democrats to put a Democrat speaker in or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That could happen. You think that could happen? After yesterday, anything could happen. Well, I mean, and okay. then Sean Hannity last night, who said, well, President Trump, he could be the speaker. Because you don't have to well, be look, a lawmaker. That, that makes no sense. I know it makes no sense, but there are, you know, Jim Jordan's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> he tried to get out of the conversation with him. Yeah. Look, the nation's on the bender. It's reflected in our <laughs> politics. Our, our, our members in Congress are reflected, uh, reflective of us. A lot of, and, and you know the old saying, we get the elections we deserve. I'm sure there's half of the, more than half of the country saying, what did I do to deserve this? Uh, but you know, Hey, Selena, you you should, the nation is on a bender. I'm, I'm, I'm not your marketing agent, but I'll tell you what, um, go get that trademarked (laughs) and put it on bumper stickers and t-shirts at selenazito.com. Make a little side cast. It's it's my story this afternoon. All right. Very good. (laughs) The nation is on a bender. Selena Zito, nation, a national political reporter, author of (laughs) the great revolt inside the populist coalition, reshaping American politics. Always check her out at selenazito.com. Thanks, Selena. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. I also liked her unmagnificent eight. Not bad. Too. That's not yeah. bad. But better if it was seven. But yeah. Yeah. All right. And she joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Listen to podcast of Dan and Amy from the AM560 mobile app. Download it today at 560theanswer.com.